Thank you for being with us and participating in Easter worship, whether you're here in the sanctuary or watching with us at home. You know, Easter begins where many of you have been at some point in the last year. For some of our families, it's been in the last year. For some of our families, it's in recent months or weeks. Some of our families, it's even in very recent days. Easter begins with people grieving the death of a loved one. It begins with people in pain, with people who have lost hope, who are going through the motions that people go through in the immediate aftermath of a death, handling details, going to the cemetery, making sure everything is set, wondering about how to go forward in life, adjusting to uncertainty and a sense of fear, and finding it hard sometimes to feel good about the future. These are all aspects of grieving, and that's where Easter begins. I'm going to be reading from the New Testament. That's the part of the Bible that tells us about Jesus. And Jesus taught for three years. He died on a Friday, and his body had been put in a tomb, and his followers, like everyone else, maybe like you, thought that dead people basically stayed dead. Most of the time, that's what happens. But early on that Sunday morning, we're going to meet some of the women who followed Jesus during his ministry, and they're on their way to the tomb to pay their final respects, and that's when they discovered something they never expected. So listen to the Easter story from Mark's gospel. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in, white, in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and they fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's quite a story, isn't it? You know, there are many grieving people who find themselves in a similar place as these women. There are a number of you who are watching and are here today for whom this is the first Easter Sunday with a loved one who is now no longer here but is with God in heaven. And Easter is a day for those who are grieving. And if there, that isn't clear, the word tomb appears four times in this story. Well, what do we know about these grieving women who come to the tomb? Well, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome, she is actually the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, two of Jesus' inner circle. Well, we learn a number of things at the very end of Mark chapter 15. If you looked in your Bible in Mark 15 and verse 40, these women are present at a distance when Jesus is dying on the cross, which tells us they have the courage to risk being publicly associated with Jesus. If you look outside the United States to countries like China and Myanmar and Iran, just to name a few, it takes a lot of courage and faith to be publicly associated with Christ because it may mean beatings or imprisonment or even death. And I wonder how I would handle that kind of environment. Do you ever wonder how you might handle that kind of environment? I mean, how many of you would be participating with us online or physically here at the building if that kind of threat hung over our 
getting together for worship. So give the women in the gospel credit. They have courage to risk being publicly associated with Christ. Are we willing to do that? Well, in the very next verse, in Mark chapter 15 and verse 41, we learn that the women followed Jesus during his ministry and they provided for his needs when he was in Galilee. They haven't been just casual or occasional observers in the crowd. They have committed themselves to following Jesus, to serving him in practical ways and providing resources to support his ministry. And again, they're an example for us. And Jesus calls us to do the same. And I'm deeply grateful to all of you who faithfully support the Lord's work here at BBC, both with your financial resources, but also with your volunteering and your time and your service in so many ways. Well, we keep going in Mark chapter 15 and verse 47, 47, we discover that the women stayed long enough after Jesus died on the cross that they were able to witness Joseph of Arimathea who asked Pilate for permission to take Jesus' body and to bury it. And so they saw the tomb where Joseph placed the body so that they knew Jesus' final, they thought, resting place. And that brings us to the story that we heard today from Mark chapter 16. And here come the women. They're going to the tomb at the first possible moment to anoint Jesus' body properly for burial. And in all these scenes, the women are examples of a virtue that's desperately needed in these days in which we are living. And that virtue is courageous compassion. Courageous compassion. I mean, it's exhausting to be a person of compassion and empathy because there's so much pain, there's so much heartache. Everywhere you look, it's just overwhelming. And so much, though, of what's wrong in our country and in our world, hatred, cruelty, and division, come from a lack of compassion, a lack of empathy. Too many people not caring about the suffering and the pain of other people. We have crises seemingly on every side this Easter Sunday, an ongoing pandemic, unending violence, political strife, tens of millions of people in our country living in poverty, environmental degradation, and it can feel overwhelming and discouraging to care about other people because there's so much to care about. But failing to care makes everything worse. Failing to care makes everything worse. And whether people look like us, whether they talk like us, whether they vote like us, whether they worship as we do, Christ followers are called to empathize with the plight of other people and to act with courageous compassion. And that's what the women who go to the tomb have done in their lives. They tell us they're followers of Jesus without telling us. They care enough about Jesus to stick with him, to support him, to follow him, even when it's risky and difficult. And as the women went to Jesus' tomb early in that morning, the question foremost in their minds was, who's going to roll away that large stone blocking the tomb? It's interesting that they knew enough to go out and to buy the spices, and they solved that problem, but they didn't solve the stone problem. And so they're worrying about it because the stone is an obstacle that is too large for them to take care of on their own. And often in life, you can spend many useless and wasted hours worrying about things that never take place or that you never end up having to face. Because God has gone before you and God has cleared a path. God has made a way. God has opened a door for you. Think about what would have happened if the women had chosen not to go to the tomb until they knew the answer to their question. What if they had just stayed home because they couldn't figure out how they could get into the tomb? Often in life, it's only in going forward in faith, even when we don't have all the answers, that God then reveals the answer. Now, the women are shocked not only that this big, large stone has been rolled away, but also to discover this young man robed in white who tells them, don't be alarmed. That's the funniest verse in the scripture, in case you didn't get that, right? You're in a tomb. 
early in the morning, and there's a guy robed in white saying, hey, don't be alarmed or anything. Too late. I'm already alarmed. And then he shares the shocking news about Jesus of Nazareth. He's been raised. He's not here. Look. And the women are charged to tell the other disciples that Jesus will meet them in Galilee just as he told them. And that phrase is really important because it's reminding the women that what happened to Jesus wasn't a surprise to Jesus. In fact, he had told them all three times, this is what's going to happen when we get to Jerusalem. And verse 8 records the women's response to this remarkable experience. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Well, why did these courageous, compassionate women flee in silence and in terror? Well, we can understand, first of all, that just being in a tomb and, you know, that alone would make some people uneasy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some other reasons why they might justifiably be afraid? Well, first of all, because they've been in the presence of God's messenger, which would be enough, most likely, to unnerve most of us. Secondly, because they might be afraid of being arrested or worse. Because remember, they're at the tomb of someone who was just executed by the Romans for treason against the state. And third, they might be concerned about the potential for being ridiculed by the disciples as unreliable witnesses if they do tell them what they just experienced because the very idea that women would be given this message in that culture is a major reversal. Someone sent me a cartoon this week and it's a picture of the women and the male disciples and the male disciples are saying to the women, well, thanks a lot for the resurrection message. We'll take it from here. And the women are all looking like, what are we, chopped liver here, you know? You know, there's something about Mark's resurrection story that distinguishes it from our memories of Easter and from the other three Gospels. And I'll give you a hint. Someone is missing. And it's not the Easter bunny. There's no Jesus. I mean, in Matthew, Luke, and John, Jesus appears, at least to Mary or to the women or to the disciples. And takes away their fear and their doubt and gives them instructions. But Mark ends almost literally in mid-sentence. And there's no appearance of the risen Jesus following the report of the young man that Christ has been raised. And a good study Bible will make plain in its notes that Mark's gospel originally ended at verse 8. And the verses that come after it are a later edition. So Mark, very ahead of his time, it ends like an interactive, unfinished story or movie. And we're invited to write the next chapter. So Mark's Easter story is in fact written as an invitation to you. It's an invitation. You're invited to become a part of God's story. You have to decide, are you going to believe this good news or not? Are you going to share this good news with anybody else or not? And the messenger told the women, go tell. I mean, that's the message to Christians. Go tell. Tell his disciples and Peter. Well, isn't Peter a disciple? Why does he get singled out? And so the question for Christians on Easter is, will you go and tell? Will you share the story? Will you accept your mission or will you remain silent and in fear? Well, the good news for the women and for us in our fear is that Jesus, the messenger says, Jesus goes before us just as he told us. And if Jesus goes ahead of us, if we want to see him, guess what we have to do? We've got to keep going. We've got to keep going forward. If we want to see him, we have to keep trusting his word and moving forward in faith. And in the command of the messenger lies the good news of forgiveness, of hope, and of new life. The good news of forgiveness is Jesus doesn't give up on you when you fail. Amen to that? You know, because, you know, we can give up on ourselves when we fail. Other people can give up on us when we fail. Jesus doesn't give up on you when you fail. 
And that's why Peter is specifically mentioned. He's the one who denied Jesus three times just the other night. And yet Jesus is looking forward to seeing him in Galilee because Peter will be forgiven. And believing the good news includes the freedom that comes with being forgiven when we fail. Even when we fail, Jesus goes before us. He's still telling us, this is the next thing you need to do. This is the next step you need to take in your journey of life and of faith. If you're ready to resume following him with all of your heart. Part of the hope of Easter is not just forgiveness. It's a renewed purpose. It's a fresh start for the disciples who have denied and betrayed Jesus. And we can betray Jesus in many ways. When we give in to the pressure of temptations and trials. When we have spoken words or made decisions that contradict who God calls us to be. When we treat people inappropriately and fail to confess and address our wrongs. When we have forsaken our commitments, ignored the lost, neglected the poor, or been indifferent to injustice. Jesus knows how his disciples fail then and now, and yet he still goes before us. He still invites us to meet him and to resume the journey together. It's like all the disciples get a do-over. You know what a do-over is? Right? Do-overs are one of the best things in life. And all the disciples are getting a do-over. And they do much better after the resurrection than they did leading up to it. They all get a do-over. Now the messenger knows, that divine messenger in the tomb, you still see him, he's still sitting over there over my shoulder. He knows who the women are looking for. The question for you on Easter is, who are you looking for? Who are you looking to? What are you looking for in your life? Do you know? Can you answer that question? You see, for Mark, the joy of Easter comes when we believe and tell the good news of the resurrection. And we all benefit from believing the good news of Easter, that God can bring resurrection out of crucifixion. God can bring hope out of despair. God can bring joy out of sorrow and even new life out of death. That's what Christians believe, that God can use anybody, even frightened women leaving a tomb, even you. Even me. We can tell the story with compassion and courage. And remember, courage doesn't mean we don't have fear. It's a really important thing to learn in life when you're young like some of you are. Courage is doing the right thing despite our fear. It doesn't mean we're never afraid. It means we do the right thing even when it's scary. And the ending of Mark's gospel, telling the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, it's left open. And as a follower of Jesus, the question is, come on, my phone's not helping me. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is are you going to tell the story of Jesus' resurrection or not? Are you going to share the good news? Are you going to share courageous compassion? Are you going to share forgiveness? Are you going to work for a just society? Are you going to hold on to hope even when it's incredibly difficult to do so? I'll be honest with you. In the days in which we're living, one of the only ways I hold on to hope is because I still believe somehow God can bring life out of death. Some of you may have seen the 1994 movie Shawshank Redemption. And in that movie, Andy Dufresne, who escapes from Shawshank Prison, writes a letter to his best friend and fellow inmate, Red. And in that letter, he writes, Remember, Red, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. And in that letter, Andy's encouraging Red to undertake a journey whose outcome is uncertain. Which basically sums up life, doesn't it? To undergo a journey whose outcome is uncertain, just like the women leaving the tomb. And the final lines spoken in that movie are spoken by Red who says, I hope to see my friend and to shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it's been in my dreams. I hope. 
For the women who left the tomb, the hope of seeing their friend again overcame their fear. Hebrews 10.23 declares, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. You have many opportunities, all of us, no matter how young or old we are, we have opportunities every day to offer hope to all who cross our path. And one way to give, share, and build hope is to help one person every day. You see that? Help one person every day. That's how we give, share, and build hope. He has been raised. He's not here is the message of the angel that gives hope to us all. Believe the good news. And the question is, what will you do when you leave here? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much that you love the world so deeply that you gave your only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. We thank you that Jesus came not to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. Gracious God, whether we've been following Jesus for decades and decades at this point, whether we have just started following Jesus as a disciple more recently, if we're even still at the point of learning more about him, gracious God, I pray that you would help us to understand that there is no better way to go through life than to go through trusting in Jesus, knowing he will lead us in a path of love and courageous compassion, of justice, of generosity, and of joy. So help us to place our life, both now and always, in your loving and merciful hands, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.